welcome to yet another episode of Contact Lost, the Polish uh, podcast about Warhammer 40k, your one-stop shop for everything competitive Warhammer 40k, uh, competitive events, uh, the biggest events in the world, actually, or, well, mm -hmm. in Europe, at least, because we do cover topics around the WTC, we do cover the topics around the LGT, uh, Probably we will also cover at some point uh, the event that happened today, which is the Polish team championships. Uh, a 45 or 45 six five man team event that has just finished. And part of Contact Lost, my son, has actually taken the first place with his team. So uh, we will try to get him on at some point to discuss how it went, what he played, what his team composition was, and so on and so on. Also important to mention, we had our contact loss team, so Salty Schledge or Herring, Salty Herring, if you might uh, want to translate that into English. So uh, our local team from Gdynia with the, the contact loss logo uh, that also went to that tournament and, and had amazing time and so on. So we will, we will also talk about this at some point. But today, today uh, we have a special guest, someone that you've know really well someone that you it, it's not a surprise because you've probably seen the, um, the, the the banners advertising this episode and you can see him on the screen right now so without further ado i'm tweak your host the usual host with me i have my co-host joker hello and our amazing guest david gaylard of team ignite fireside <laughs> podcast and team new zealand welcome dude Yes, hi. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were going to join because uh, I think you have just got married and I imagine that, you know, you, you, you still have pretty much going on right now in your life. Is that correct? Is that a good assumption? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, I got the ring on. Yeah, yeah. Just been Congrats. married just in Greece. Uh, I basically flew out to Greece uh, the day the balance data slate dropped. So I've been... Uh, kind of just getting back into the swing of things and uh, looking at things from afar. So uh, Yeah, so you know. a lot to, to, to catch up with, yeah. so to say. Um, so listen, everyone, this is an episode, another episode of the series that we are doing in preparation for the LGT. We will be covering the LGT on the spot, right there on the floor for you, uh, together with Wargames Live. Wargames Live is going to stream the games and we are going to do like the end of round summaries, intro to the next round and so on. In between the rounds, you will see see us with Joker live. Uh, but in order to prepare for the LGT, we are doing the series called uh, the, the LGT's Lucky 7, because it's the seventh iteration of the event or the seventh uh, edition of the event. And we just thought that it might be cool to do a series that sort of revolves around the number seven to, you know, somehow commemorate this. So today we have David to talk about uh, an interesting topic. Uh, by the way, we did a similar thing with David last year when we were also doing a, a series uh, preparing for the LGT. That time he was our guest with Vic and uh, we were talking about tilting and how to manage tilting and manage stress and so on and, and the expectations and, and everything around a major event like this one. And we thought that it might be a good idea to pitch this idea to uh, or this topic to David to talk about potential mistakes before or during the event and david caught this bait he 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 enjoys i think he enjoys the topic and i from what i've seen he came prepared so david before we dive into the topic a little bit about yourself so you, you've had a very busy year this year apart from the wedding like 40k wise so tell us a little bit about that and how uh, your preparation for the lgt is going yeah so, yeah, so this year has been pretty busy. Uh, at the start of the year, we, we started Team Ignite. Um, so me, Brian, Jochen, Vic are the founders of that team. And we've just recently expanded to uh, include the lovely Mycin as well, who's a part of your network as well. Uh, and then so, yeah, I've had a couple of super major wins um, before then uh, throughout the year. And then we had uh, Warhammer Fest played second place to Ennis Wilson, the grand final. So it's been a pretty, pretty uh, decent year for me overall. Um, pretty happy with how I've played overall. Uh, but, um, yeah, new experience playing at WTC. That was just absolutely incredible. Team New Zealand, we did fantastically. We're uh, super excited about next year as well. And that's just opened up a huge perspective for me about the community, the way to play the game, and uh, the levels of play, especially in the wider European region, which has been really exciting. And I think uh, we're going to try and translate that, some of that with my team, into the European team events uh, in the future. And 
And as you mentioned, Myson's team won the Polish Nationals uh, tournament with uh, two of my teammates, Myson and Liam Viesel uh, as well. So <laughs> they, uh, we're spreading around. But yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been going well. You know, we've obviously been in a pretty turbulent time, I think, which is actually a really bad um, a bad game state for me in particular, I think. I think if uh, upon reflection, I think I'm probably not the best player in turbulent waters when it comes to the game's balance. Uh, I... I'm typically a player that really loves a solved meta, playing uh, very ultra-tuned lists uh, and just trying to encapsulate all the knowledge. So I feel like I've struggled a little bit then, uh, particularly under time constraints as well. So I haven't really been able to execute my best strategy. Like that's not like that's not where I'm the best. I think. Whereas some players, uh, you know, Vic VJ is a really good example of this. A great list builder and someone who's really good at just taking theory and putting it right on the table. Uh, so we're not all gifted like that. Um, and it takes me a lot of reps to get <laughs> to reach my to reach the point where I'm really happy. So yeah, it's been an interesting time for the game. You know, we've had the balance balanced data slate as well. So that was just you know, no one really knows what's going to happen. And then uh, then it all got released on Thursday. So I think Games Workshop has done a, a pretty good job with that. It's been the most comprehensive one to date, I think. And uh, you know, I'm certainly not complaining. Um, so it's thrown the game into a really open state, I think. So yeah, we've got the LGT coming up and. Um, Practice has just recently started again for me. And so, yeah, I'm trying to take, I guess, a lot of the seven things I'm going to be talking about and and translating that to uh, hopefully, it'd be nice to finally, uh, well, the second time around, it'd be nice to um, not lose to Alexander Seiko at uh, LGT. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the beginning that's... of Tenf has been quite interesting. I mean, we've had the major event in the WTC after just the edition release, and now we have LGT just after a balanced data slate, which was, well, quite a game changer. So, that's definitely going to be very interesting in a totally unrelated topic did you file for new zealand captain for next year or did you not <laughs> uh yes i did yes i filed to okay. uh put my vote in for the new zealand captaincy so obviously i would be over the moon if uh, that was successful for me whether well, successful or not for me i would be i'll definitely be back in the next year but i'm i'm very confident that uh you know especially in the right hands um team new zealand is gonna be doing very well next year uh, I know we've got a, uh, a really skilled team. We've got a great platform. So, and you know, the team people from New Zealand are just really solid players. And you know, for a, a, you know, the thing we lack the most of is um, are some of the connections and the practice and the preparation that a lot of teams already have and have done. So, you know, applying just that basic structure to already great players is uh, a recipe for success, as far as I'm concerned. So, yes, I'm very excited about that next year. So, uh, you, you said a couple of minutes ago that uh, you are a player that enjoys a solved meta. Um, so, would you say that that was the case last year at the LGT? Uh, that you, you, you had more time <laughs> to prepare and you could bring a list that you're more familiar with? Or was it also not the, the, the perfect state of game for you? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no. I mean, it was the perfect state of game for me. I think um, if anyone were to bet, perhaps I would be one of the favorites going into that tournament. I just won... Birmingham Super Major, I had won uh, London Major, I'd won a GT, I had won the Leeds Super Major four tournaments in a row. I think I was 37 and 0 in tournament games and about. Mm-hmm. Uh, with Tyranids, right? Yes, yes. With, this is with the and Tyranids, and I was mm-hmm. thinking maybe 60 and 0 in practice included as well. So, um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, hit Alexander Seiko. Um, and then, you know, hey, dice didn't go my way that way as well. And, um, Maybe I would do it differently. You know, Alex and I have talked about that a bunch of times. Um, but at the end of the day, the player that Alex is, is, you know, you've got to take risks at some point as well. And if the math, if you hit the, the short end of that math, then, um, then that's just where it's going to be, right? That's 40K. Like you've got to, you know, one thing that I didn't, not, is not in my top seven is, um, you know, win, lose, just try and play well. And those games where you don't, that goes, those games where you play well, um and lose and that's you know that's you can walk away from that happily like you can play a perfect game and still lose so coming to grips with that is um has been a big part of my process over the last two or three years as well Mm -hmm. Uh, you know it's so you know it's perfectly fine to lose as well um what's not good is to maybe play a lot worse than you otherwise would because then you're not doing yourself a service so that's something that will probably gut you for a lot longer than losing to something that is out of your control in a manner of speaking yeah definitely and uh to be fair alex was on the roll last year and was if you're listening to anyone, might as well be the winner of the actual event, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, and in a, in a big tournament like that, this isn't in the list as well, is that, you know, it's just like poker and whatnot like that. You know, you've got to be running well. Um, there's there's plenty of top players that have got the capability of winning the tournament. And, you know, one of those, one of, you know, if there's 10 top players uh, or 15 top players that are 
uh, skillful enough to win a tournament like that, you know, one or two of them is just going to be having things go their way on the on the really crucial rounds and the and the rounds that matter as well, right? You know, um, so that's the storylines that um, do happen under an event that perhaps some people don't see when they just see the rankings on the uh, on the internet um, the week after. Yeah, I think that's the, the the problem of our scene. People judging stuff by win rates and people judging stuff just by like on you know looking at the surface, like almost just reading the headline and not really getting into the thick of uh, of, of of how the event went. But I uh, I figured that you're you know sort of yearning to get into that topic of the top seven. So why not start now? So maybe let's go with your number seven. So yeah, yeah, let's. I mean, yeah. I mean, honestly, they're, they're not in descending order. Um, and you know, okay, I was um, I was playing a, I was playing a practice game earlier today, and I was kind of trying to think about you know what was um, you know some mistakes that I was making. So try and try and take on these are genuinely things that I mess up as well, right? So this is kind of things that I'm focusing on as well. But also, I've got a couple of things in there which I think just apply to everyone. And for the for the top seven that I'm going to bring today, it's not just about seven mistakes that you make in game because Warhammer is a game that ultimately what happens in the game is a combination of so much time and effort that happens outside of that one particular three-hour game so you know i'm a big believer in um in this first one because i believe you've got to have the right tools for the job uh, at the end of the day so number seven number seven and no descending order because some might apply to you more than others mm -hmm. build army lists that have a clear game plan now um this one is super important. And I think, you know, LGT is a really good example, is going to be a good example of this because with the balanced data slate recently, we've had a, a big influx of change in the game. Uh, you know, LGT terrain is, I wouldn't say untested, but it's not mature, right? Like this is the second tournament, I think, uh, of this terrain pack. I think so. Uh, Link London Open and then LGT. Uh, and so that coupled with the fact that we've had a lot of secondary changes that have opened up the game a lot, I think means that this time more than any, you've got to have your list um, list game plan down. So your list game plan might be: I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to try and table my opponent, and I'm going to score tacticals if I'm going tactical um, as the game goes on. And then so I'm going to have 80% of my list be um, things that can actually just trade up, trade up efficiently, and then I'm going to have 20% of that, um, you know, 400 points just for pure chaff tactical gameplay. Okay, that's fantastic. You know, you might be on the other side of things, right? You might say, I'm going to take fixed and I'm going to make sure that I can score seven points every turn and then hammer my opponent's primary. Okay, that's cool. And then maybe I just want to play something that's super durable or tanky or something might be. And it, it might get even so far as down to, you know, my game plan is I'm going to take, you know, four transports and I'm going to load them all up and I'm going to have this unit here that always goes to my opposite objective first and then this unit here that can ready to stage and then springboard into my opponent's army those things there are what really develop a consistent game plan and oftentimes when it comes to practice and a, a tournament you might not be playing the most optimal list um you know no one i mean who plays the most optimal list at the end of the day especially not in a tournament like this we're all going to look back in hindsight and think oh i could have done things differently but if you've got a game plan even if it's a little bit suboptimal if you've got the reps and the practice with it it's really going to shine through at the end of the day so even if you're playing something i don't know weird like, i don't know four rhinos for example right okay we might not all think that's the best but if you've got the knowledge of well i can always do you know it's got this kind of bad matchup but you know if i can i know that you know my rhino can go do cleanse or i can go do deploy talent homers or i can you know i this one i push around the flank and then i go tag something you know having the amount of reps on that is uh, super important. And the thing about it is it's an asymmetrical knowledge basis, right? Because you're the person turning up the four rhinos and your opponent kind of goes, well, that doesn't seem, that seems like a lot of wasted points, but you go, well, actually I know because I've played this so much that you, I can get more value out of them like this and all like that. So you suddenly become a bit of an expert. So the more that you refine your game plan and stick to it and, and get more and more out of it, I think the more dangerous of a player you become. So, the worst case scenario is you just go, oh, I just take all these things because I think they're good. Um, and then you get to the middle of your game and turn three, you draw, investigate signals or something, right? And you go, oh, you know, I've, I haven't, <laughs> none of my units are faster. None of them uh, re-deep strike at the end of the turn. Bugger, right? Or I've got just three big brick bricks while investigate signals, do, you know. So um, that's the scenario you don't want to be in, um, especially when it comes to secondaries. Uh, secondaries is the easiest way, I think, to build a complete game plan around, um, you know, or, pot or potentially like a data sheet, right? If you've got a strong battle line data sheet, um, I don't know, you want to play 300 term against, 
120, uh, you know, play 120 term against, right? Um, but at least you've got a game plan going into it. And then once you get, I think once you get adept at identifying a game plan, then you can kind of go, oh, actually, you know, this game plan is good. Okay, that game plan is good. This is the game plan for the meta right now, which is going to be really successful. And then, you know, you kind of um, work around these archetypes and understand how to push them and develop them. Yeah. What are you guys' thoughts? So I actually have a uh, have a question first, uh, or like maybe not a question, but an attempt to, to summarize things that you need to take into account when you're building a list. Uh, and here comes the question. When you build your lists in 10th edition, this might be new to... Uh, to, 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 to our listeners who only started playing in 10th edition. But do you build a list that is able to play both tactical and fixed if need be? Or mm. do you go for just one type of uh, missions? No. Yeah, see, see, I think I think the exact opposite. You just build it. If you're going to go tactical, you go in tactical every game. Unless your opponent gives up assassinate and bring it down all in one combo, mm-hmm. then of course, you know, okay, that's a free weed, right? Okay, great. Um, but if you're going fixed, you always need to know what your basically two fixed are going to be as well. So you might take teleport homers and cleanse, for example, right? Or you might take teleport homers and bring it down. Your know, teleport homers is the one build around, I think, right now. We can all agree. That's great. Teleport homers behind enemy lines you might take. You might take homers and engage. You know, homers is just super easy and uninteractive. So it's kind of about solving that last one. Um, but you might have like a really good game plan for doing homers and then being really aggressive. And then you might have a suboptimal game plan for cleanse, but that's okay, right? Because you're aggressive and able to be able to do homers, right? So I think that's the that's the build around you want to go for these days, yeah. And of course, at the same time, you know, being cautious about um, you know what what the weaknesses of your game plan. For example, you know, um, a lot of people are talking about Tau these days. Well, Tau gives up max for bring it down, of course. So if your opponent already has a strong homer t- um, uh, ability, then they're going to be getting homer plus bring it down, right? So, you know, you've got to be able to combat that as well. So, you know, having a clear game plan is really good. You know, um, when I played my first LVO, play a place terrain, uh, I found it really difficult to adapt, but I knew that I could place one big ruin on the line and place six hive guard behind that. And you could never shoot them and I could mm-hmm. shoot them all game. And I was like, that's my game plan. I'm just going to put six hive guard on the line and um, I'll double shoot you every single turn. And there's no way you can shoot them. And um, yeah, okay. If it works, it works, right? Mm-hmm. Um Worked well for me that game, um, but um, yeah, that's that's I've been mean, yeah I got a little bit lucky maybe on that one. But uh, you know I played Warhammer Fist for example. I played a super or, or like wonky guard list. Um, no one had played, um, and you know my game plan was to hit eighty seven points every single game. And I had one, two, three specific units for my secondaries every single game, and everything was built around getting eighty seven plus points while denying a primary. Um, and that's what I did. Um, worked out well for me there. So. Yeah, that's um that's kind of that's kind of the direction I think. And if you've got you know the best armies have a powerful game plan and a lot of board pressure, or you know a super durable and can score well, you know um, they're always kind of like you know things that are just obvious when they hit the table. They're like, wow, he's gonna oh man, he's gonna pressure me and he's gonna be scoring these. Like man, that's really tough. Um, the lists that are kind of just like, well, he's kind of like we're both kind of doing stuff, but he's not really racking up points. You know, it's kind of like wow, okay, you know what are we doing here? Mm-hmm. So. One other aspect that I think you need to take into account when, when you're building your list is the terrain that you're going to be playing on. We've, you've, you've mentioned the LGT terrain that maybe it's not solved yet. Maybe it could use some tweaks. But definitely, when you go to the, to the WTC, for example, you need to account for the terrain that, are, that is going to be there. And then when you go to the LGT or when you go to the States and you play player place terrain, your list need, needs to be prepared for that, right? Yeah. Have the yeah. UK TC maps actually changed since ninth? Or yeah, yeah yes, so they have changed significantly since ninth edition. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, with the new missions and whatnot like that. Um, the f- one of my first so so they have changed. One of my first impressions was um, what, the first thing that I did was I counted up the number of, of the pieces of the terrain and noticed that they were exactly the same. So it's the same eight. You know, I want to say eight off time. It's probably ten. Um, you know, two bigs, two ultra bigs, four um, four mediums and four smalls makes up ten pieces. And I noticed that they're a lot more denser in the middle. So what they've done is effectively compress them all into the middle of the board. So, you know, what's the obvious part of that? Well, I think, you know, deep striking, it's harder to hold your objective and be hidden from the back end of deep strike and um, and and outflank. So maybe considering something like that is important. But I think with this next point I've got, which is point six, I'll get onto it. It's called tournament prep. 
not putting models on the terrain and trying to find interesting combos uh, for the terrain. So I think it's, you know, as much as we do play TTS these days, I still think it's important to just maybe if you really, if you're really keen, have your own set at home for the UKTC maybe, but you know, same thing applies for WTC. Uh, and then, you know, or go to your game store, not maybe to play a game, but just maybe to say, you know, maybe just bring in my models and, and think about, oh, if I could put, place this one here, then, you know, I know an eight inch movement actually opens up this specific angle on the board. Or, you know, if I've got my Rogal Dawn, I always want to place it on this part of my deployment zone because one movement gets me here. I can tank all the damage. Second movement lets me see into their open ruin on a guaranteed, you know, if I roll a minimum three. Um, <laughs> um, so I move uh, move 13 and then uh, move 10 and I'll be able to shoot 23 which will let me see down this open side of the ruin and I can play this one really defensively because my Chimera fits snugly in this in the little L and actually I know my Chimera fits right here and that it's closed off from the other angle that most armies if they move 10 won't be able to shoot so things like that are just so powerful you know if, you, if you're able to go well I can guarantee do this and, and this is kind of the player that I am I like these, these hard rules that I've always got you know if I, I know I can do this or I know I can do that and it's just a powerful thing thing so you know uh, one thing i thought was fantastic was uh in wtc i think i think it was the forge fiend that could see over this the first ruin of the small of the medium kind of like um the medium ruins um because and you could sit wholly onto it and then one piece could stick above it and you could see out of the ruin which i thought was really um really clever because the height of the model sees over the one little part so stuff like that is really um really ingenuitive and and you can do that with lots of things you know you can do that with um you could do it with not, um small knights as well of course but you know you might be able to do that with a um a model that can fit inside the small um uktc ruin for example and then you could put put yourself wholly on it and then see outside of it depending on if it's got the um height or something like that so I think that's really cool. Um, you know, games, you know, Warhammer Fest when I played that um, was really, really important because I built my entire list to play on that terrain. When I analyzed the terrain, I kind of noticed a few similarities. I noticed that you could basically hold two objectives behind the big, <coughs> excuse me, the big GW ruins. And I was like, well, if I can hold two objectives every time and I know that they're lost blocked, line of sight blocked on the bottom, then all I have to do is hit my opponent's primary ones and then score my secondaries. It doesn't even matter if I table them or not. And then I'll be getting 87 to 90 points. Um, and if my opponent always takes bring it down, then they're going to be struggling to get that because I'm actually going to be playing defensively when they think I'm playing aggressively. So, you know, analyzing the terrain, seeing whether everything can fit is really important. Um, you know, UKTC, a lot of the missions, the middle objective isn't hidden, right? So, you know, you might want to think about, well, how can I hold the middle objective? Um, because it's kind of like a big kill zone um so things like that or you know if no one's going to hold the middle objective how do i make sure i hold my the one in no man's land for myself and then maybe pressure my opponent's one and what units and combinations can i use to make sure that that's going to be happening three to four times of the game and and kind of you know the gap between these two ruins is seven inches so if i've got a you know a unit of um i don't know warp talons or something they can move 12 and then they can hit something um on their pressured objective from my staging ruin stuff like that um really really important is it's so so valuable like obviously playing games is really important but actually you know sitting down and finding just finding that little nice thing that goes oh you know yeah I put this like this and i can do this every single game you know it's just every single game i put my unit here and i attack that one um you know that's really really solid then finding these little nooks and crannies and little nuances in the mission and whatnot um i really can really pay off um big time so it's really hard to underestimate that one I definitely agree. I mean, especially that point you made about TTS, because sometimes uh, all the models on TTS are identical in the squad, which is not necessarily the case when you physically have them. And then also, you know, it's much easier or it seems easier. Uh, obviously, I'm moving from here to here on TTS. I can get the exact angle I need, zooming in, whatever, and see the enemy unit. But actually being able to catch these angles on the actual terrain is super important as well so yeah, yeah definitely agree with that point yeah uh yeah especially on uktc i feel like the boards are quite dense as well and it can be quite difficult to maybe look around a corner and shoot something um so yeah 100 but you need to find out ways to doing that right you need to be like well if i move my tank twice then you know i get this angle or if i rapid ingress and then i move um you know then i can get a, a big open angle or something right so yeah yeah you've got to really think about you know Think about what what is popular in the meta as well, and then think about you know what you can what you can do in a game plan as well. Mm. I have a question because I haven't read into the uh, UKTC rules 
that deeply yet, but I think the WTC has a ruling about, for example, like moving big monsters, be it, you know, big demons like Bellacor or uh, Mortarian, for example. Uh, so the ruling that the WTC is using, I'm not sure about any other uh, rulings, is that if you want <coughs> to move, for example, Mortarian, you need to be careful about his wings and so on. If that he doesn't fit, you need to pivot him. And then pivoting on the spot costs you movement even with like monsters and so on. Is that the same at the UKTC? Because probably this is also something that players need to take into account. Yeah, yeah. No, look, great point as well. You know, something... So, A, I think that is correct because uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I've always played it this way, movement is that you no such part of the model can move more than its max movement. So you can't move something and then pivot it because then the backside will be moving more than, you know, 10 inches if it moves 10 inches. Um, so, yeah, that's a great point as well. You know, you want, if you've got a model like Mortarian, you want to know, like, oh, if, you know, I always orientate his wings like this, for example, or I always sit him in the medium L like this, because then I know that if an opponent's got a 10 inch moving platform, they can't move down and see the edge of his wing. And then I know, like, oh, he can always get to this spot with a two advance or something like that as well. So, yeah, you always want to kind of know, like, for example, you know, I played Leviathan did so much, you know, um, I always knew that my hive tyrant would sit in the medium L a very specific way just to make sure that, like, it cut the closest angle possible for him. Um, so, yeah, little things like that is, is really fantastic as well. And, and look, if you're playing big models, you need to be really ace on, you know, knowing where they can go. So, like, for example, I, so I play the Rogal Dawn a lot. And trust me, I'm looking for any excuse to play my beautifully painted Rogal Dawn. Um, just went down, like, 25 points, actually. Um, but I know on some missions, on the corner missions, for example, it's going to be quite hard to activate that unit. So I know that, you know, regardless of what my opponent's playing, I always basically put it in one spot because even if they're playing a different army or they might have deployed differently, I know that the only way for me to get angles into the ruins is going to be through this through this alleyway or through this part of the board that I need to drive through. And even if it looks like, oh, it might be better to put it down here, I know in my heart that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to my guns and put it up here and put it up in, in the normal spot because there's a solid logic you've got behind that. Like you've got reps and game plans behind that as well. So developing those rules is, is really important. It's a big philosophy of how kind of I play the game as well. All right, I think we've exhausted the topic of terrain. So do, do we want to move to the mm. next point on your list? Yeah, the next point. So so this kind of tournament prep. Um, I guess this one, next one's probably tournament prep as well, really. Um, and uh, it's called number five, not playing up the entire game slash not thinking about the differential scoring. So I think developing as a 40K player, it's, it's really important to, you know, not give up when, you, when you're playing as well, right? So there's obviously, you know, obviously 40K is a dice game. And we've all been in those positions where the game, you know, is pretty much over. But actually, it's the times where you develop most as a player when you try and really push your mental agility to see the thinnest lines, see the absolute miracle ways you could possibly win. You know, I like to think of 40K as, and, and many things in life as, you know, it's a giant decision tree, right? And throughout the course of the game, that decision tree gets, you know, greener or redder, depending on the uh, the board state, right? All the things that have happened, right? So more greener being... <coughs> You know, you've got more opportunities to win. The more decisions that you go by, the more of them will be successful to win. And and red being the fewer that will lost. And and you know, you know, we've all been in those games where the the most of the decision tree is looking red, right? But it's almost like regardless of how much damage you've taken, there's always going to be some sliver of green left in that decision tree. And that you know, it may be you need to roll you know a bunch of saves on this. You need to this needs to go perfectly, and this needs to go well. And then you can you know you can try and salvage it. So you know, this kind of ties into like not giving up like you should continue to try and play the best of your game to the best of your ability regardless of whether or not it's happened on turn one or if it's happened on on turn four because focusing on the differential scoring means that you're going to be focusing more on the points of the game so a lot of ways i see players not improving is they focus on you know this kills this this kills that and this does this and oh he's got his he's got his massive thing that kills me still alive i've lost the game and the reality is, is that whilst the units that you have alive are a, are a very good description of how the state of the game, you know, they ultimately don't always win you the game. You know, you can, if you focus on the scoring part of the game more often, I think you'll probably change your mentality around from, oh, this game's unwinnable to, 
actually, this is a 12.8, um, which would be a 10 point differential. You know, actually, this is not far off. And, you know, if I change my list a little bit, then I could probably make it a 10.10. 10. And then if I practice a lot, then I could probably make that an 11.9 on a good day, or I can reliably make that 11.9 if I've got more practice. And then I can make it a 12.8 against someone who doesn't know the matchup so well. So then all of a sudden, your list construction kind of becomes, becomes a bit different, right? Because then you go, well, I know I just need a little bit more for this matchup, and then I can make it a 10.10. And then if I practice a lot, 11.9. And that actually gives me another 150 points for this other matchup, which I'm expecting to encounter as well. So this is a big part of how I think about the game too. On those tough matchups, I want to just have the bare minimum and then a bit of skill on top to win those matchups. And then I want to focus on the things that I'm most commonly going to encounter. Um, so the reason differential scoring there is so important is because it keeps your eye on the prize of actually just how far away you are from winning the game. And a lot of players, they tend to give up early, which gives a misrepresentation of how the game might actually play out. You know, I think we've all kind of gone through 40K, you know, chatting with 40K with friends and and people have gone, oh, that matchup's so bad. You know, it's unwinnable or, you know, oh, that's a 20 yo, you know. And then you go, mate, like, trust me, it's like 12-8. <laughs> um, or, you know, it's a 14-6, which is a lot different from a 20 yo, right? You know, uh, a 12-8, anything can happen. You you know, some person could spike massively and then you go like, okay, suddenly it's a 10 10 right um so yeah it's 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 really important and, you know this goes into teams right of course you know we all know that the matrix is super important getting accurate estimates of um matchups on, on boards and missions is one of the most critical parts of being successful on a team and i'm not i'm not a professional team player so um i'm, I'm not uh, not going to claim that title but it's been a big part um about how i've seen teams as well and how i've seen the top teams operate there um so it's it's difficult you know, everyone, um, everyone struggles to evaluate matchups, you know, point for point and well. And um, if you're not evaluating your matchups correctly, then the chances are you're going to be, your list building is going to come to a point that's not optimal for the tournament either. So yeah, really focus on the points, focus on differential scoring, which is going to focus you to play out the entire game. And all of a sudden, you know, obviously it's not the same for singles, but if you go, oh, I kind of know this is a losing matchup, I'm going to go for an 11-9. And then all of a sudden there's a bit of a flip. And then from a singles perspective, you're suddenly in the game, right? But if you just go from a singles perspective, oh, I'm just going to all in them, you know, 1% chance it goes well. It, it doesn't go well, then, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's a very easy way for your opponent to win after that, right? It's not, you know, if you throw the game, it's very easy for your opponent to make zero mistakes, right? If your opponent just has to go, well, I just have to shoot and charge my whole army, then, okay, that's game. But if you're actually forcing the game to be tight, you're focusing on the points, then your opponent's going to be stressing out a lot more than 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 they otherwise would be, right? And it's when, when mistakes happen in 40k where people really, you know, that's where games get decided, right? <laughs> Certainly for my case, you know, um, everyone makes mistakes, and uh, that's the that's the whole part about 40k. And the more mistakes you can force, then uh, you know, the more opportunities you're going to have to win a matchup that you might think is, oh, this matchup's unwinnable. Yeah. So, do you think that the tactical missions and the randomness of them actually? further contributes to to the point you're trying to make or was mm -hmm. you know even last year uh or just playing fixed missions um a better solution because tactical seems to be that bit of rng that you were talking about that could you know suddenly bad cards could happen to your opponent good cards could come for you this is not something that you can really plan for more or less yeah yeah look i didn't even think about that uh that uh atomic but you're 100 percent right you know we've all had those games too where your opponent just seems to get the best cards on the first two turns and you get awful cards you're just like oh my word but it's super critical in those moments to just remember look i've still got you know okay my opponent's drawn well but i've still got the opportunity to draw cards that will work really well for me um which is just an even more excuse to just keep in it and play the game right you know you might get like you might just draw that i don't know engage on all fronts behind and deploy homers right boom, nine points, um, or, you know, later in the game. Or your opponent might continue to draw, like, overwhelming force and kind of, like, secu uh, secure no man's land, right? And it's like, well, actually, you can't do any of those. Or you can do secure no man's land for two. And all of a sudden, it's like, well, he's dropped a turn of basically what should have been about eight points, and you're operating it. Um, you know, you might draw into a turn, we get nine points. So there's a seven-point swing there already, right? Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, the cards are even a better excuse to just stay in the game. Right. And, you know, over the course of the game, you should also go, you know, what cards didn't I draw? And if you, well, if I kind of drew this one at this point, then it would have been like plus three or, you know, kind of one like that. And just to, just to make sure that you're getting the, you know, the most accurate representation, representation of what you think the game is going to end up being like. So I wanted to ask about this because, uh, I find it extremely intriguing whether 
pro players like yourself do it. And by pro, I mean, you know, people who yeah, sure. do, aim at the, going at the biggest events and actually winning them. So uh, when we talk about cards, but let, let's talk about like card games, like, I don't know, uh, uh, Poker Magic or together. Bridge or... No, well, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. We can Magic play Bridge. Also. I, played, I played a lot of 500. <laughs> so, so, so the question is, when you play a, a 40k game with tactical cards, do you only focus on the cards that you have on hand right now? Or do you also try to plan for the future by thinking, hmm, I haven't drawn, I don't know, um, behind enemy lines yet, but my, ar my army is good at doing that. So if I get this in the next turn or in two turns, I'll score this and this. Do you actually plan that far ahead? Or do yeah. you try to focus on, you know, uh, um, carpe diem and just play the cards that you have on the table and whatever happens, happens? Yeah, look, no, perfect. So actually at WTC, I had two decks of uh, tactical charge cards. So at WTC, I was playing mainly tactical. And what I would do is, uh, particularly in the later turns of the game, so the easiest one is obviously investigate signals, right? You draw that turn one. Well, you need something <laughs> to be able to do it, right? So, okay, make sure maybe you position your things in your deployment zone where you can do investigate signals if you draw a turn one or or deploy teleport homes, right? Or something like that, right? Maybe engage. Um, but, you know, what I would do is I'd actually have two tactical decks and um, one deck I would put, I would take out the cards that I have drawn just so I would know, okay, my possibility of drawing is this, for example. Um, so I would have one deck that I would play the normal game with, and then the other deck I would just have my remaining cards in. So I'd be able to have a probabilistic output of like, oh, I could probably draw like this is a one and six, for example. Where this becomes really big is if you, you know, generate new orders, if you were to shuffle, okay, what are your percent chance that you're going to hit the card that you need, right? So, I mean, you don't have to go to that extreme, but I think... It's always good to have a grasp on what the freebies kind of are, right? Like, you've obviously got Bring It Down Assassinate, right? Which are going to mandatorily mean that you have to interact with your opponent. But a lot of them are pretty non-interactive, right? You know, you need to go secure No Man's Land or extend battle lines or No Prisoners, right? Like, if not, or something like that. Yeah, exactly, right? Like, if you're not doing No Prisoners and Overwhelming Force, like, I mean, what are you kind of doing? You know, you kind of have to be able to do that. So those ones kind of play themselves. But, you know, just think about like, oh, okay, you know, this one's coming up or I've still got this one in the deck. You know, engage on all fronts is a really good one to remember. Um, teleport homers is really good. And that's where, like, you know, the units that can bounce around every turn get even better. Like, the Caldus Assassin is, you know, offers a lot of flexibility now, even though it its Vect got worse, but its points um, came down a lot. Um, you know, that can, just a unit like that can fix your secondaries a lot, you know. Bounce around every single turn. You know, it's a 25 millimeter base. You can get behind any lines. Um, so, stuff like that's really important. And, you know, focusing on that is important. But I wouldn't say you know, trying to navigate and predict the cards is important as, you know, tournament prep and then um, building armulus per se. But it's very, but it's much more important to focus on, you know, this is the matchup. This is what the points I should be expecting. I kind of know the key things that are going to happen during the game. You know, Tau, for example, you got six crisis suits. Well, they rapid ingress them and they try and blow something up, right? Like, okay, that's how, that's kind of like the main game plan, you know? Um, so, you know, how do I deal with that? When that does happen, how can I make sure that I'm recovering to score my secondary still well and maybe I have got a unit that can set up to charge them after they fire and fade 14 inches, I think, off the top of my head. Um, just the little things like that, right? Like, can you kind of need to know the main parts of how each matchup plays and the big turns and stuff like that. And and then, you know, always focus on the points. Um, Manny Chima taught me that more than anyone. Uh, make sure you focus on the points. Because I saw that guy play when we played and it's like, he was like, well, okay, that's seven points of primary. That's four points of primary. That puts that ministry. And I was like, man, okay, I've been I've been playing the game just trying to kill people and not get killed. <laughs> but uh, like, as soon as you start focusing on the points, you see the game through a really different perspective. Okay. So I don't know if this ties in with what we are going to talk about, but I guess I wanted to ask about your list building again. And if in your list building, you specifically go for meta countering and then mm. if you do and i think this is a question that uh that pumba actually asked um in in our community discord so i'm just going to read out the question uh how much time do you usually spend analyzing the possible meta that might be in place at the event do you normally focus on developing the army or a list that you would consider to be the strongest or do you try to counter the meta that you expect there and when you oh, design okay. the list, do you fill out the matrix of possible matchups to validate if the list will work? Or do you go off with your uh, gut feeling? Yeah, man, that is a... Oh, that's Loaded a question. question. <laughs> yeah, man, that's a tough one. Um, 
So obviously, we, like obviously, we've got LGT coming around the corner. So I'm not going to talk about it in terms of context of LGT because there are things that I'm that I'm doing. So um, let's talk about it in terms of Warhammer Fest because I think that's kind of a, a good example, right? So I was just for context, guys. I was playing Swift as the Wind, Armored Superiority, Imperial Guard. No one's ever played this before. I'm playing like melee relics, warlord traits, like stuff that no one, like literally no one plays, and no one played it afterwards. I don't know why. It's like a great list. Um, but um, yeah, so so for that one, that that's a good example of where I spent the majority of the time focusing on my own game plan. I thought I looked at the terrain, I looked at what I can do, and I knew a fundamentally powerful way of playing the game was to try and have a high scoring game consistently, whilst nuking my opponent's primary. So. It was kind of irrespective of what like what army I was up against, uh, because the guard secondaries back then were quite uninteractive, right? You had boots on the ground, and you had um, uh, uh, retrieve Nuckman data, and oh, blessed how I forget the last one, uh, inflexible command, which is fifteen. Mm -hmm. um, so you know you had those three, and you could execute a very similar game plan every single time. So it doesn't matter if your opponent were playing Chaos Knights or Ennis Wilson playing uh, Iron Hands at the time, uh, or Manu Chima playing all the Deathwing Knights. Um, you could you know, you could you could execute the same game plan every single time. And that's, I think, you know, I think I, pr I kind of nailed it as best as I could that tournament in terms of thinking about a powerful list, a powerful strategy, and something that worked beautifully on the train. And that was a bit off meta. Um, and so, you know, I, I mean, I love it when the, when the meta is kind of solved like that and you can just push the envelope a little bit more and I can take in all the information at once. But I think in a time of flux, in a time of change, it is really important to think about what is going to be in the meta as well, right? So, you know, if we look at the meta, you know, kind of what got a lot better from the balance data state, right? So, I mean, it's going to be probably no surprise. Like, I think Necron Warriors are probably the most talked about. Oh, Necron Warriors, right? So I'm going to segue this right into point number four because it kind of segues beautifully there as well. But yeah, you do need to think about the meta, right? And one way you can think about the meta is point number four, kind of knowing the math. And knowing the math is extremely important. The difference between almost killing something and uh, killing something on average, it can be basically game and, and not game for some of these units, yeah, right? Like very much we've so. all played against those like Necron warriors where you go, okay, I'm going to put like my three Lehman Russes and uh, my Rogodorn and six flame and eight flamers. Oh yeah. Okay, great. On average, that kills down to like three warriors. Great. Well, that means nothing. <laughs> Because they're going to regenerate three times or something, and then uh, and then they basically have their old squad back, and you've achieved absolutely nothing. Then, um, you know, what's another good example? Uh, you know, um, killing a ghost arc has fourteen wounds, four of them vulnerable, so they've got flat six damage. You know, probably not that great against it, right? Or you know, killing the incarn, um, or having you know, what's another? What well, this is a great one, having a unit that survives versus uh, a night spinner activation. You know. Because that's going to be really common probably going forward. Right? Like obviously Eldar is still really powerful, and I think Yinkan is like no surprise to anyone. It's going to be quite popular, I would imagine. It's a very powerful unit. It didn't get any fundamental rules changes, and so you know one of the common ways Eldar can um, kill stuff is you know maybe indirecting a Night Spinner at something. So maybe having a squad that doesn't die to Night Spinner, maybe focusing on things that have three wounds rather than two wounds, um, is is really good because some of your backfield stuff might get exposed to Yinkan popping in. Um, so yeah. That ties into knowing the meta well. Like you need to anticipate what is going to be popular, but at the same time, you can make people respect you by having your own powerful strategy. So you know, Eldar sort of does it. It's a great example. It's an army that can take fixed and tactical, depending on the situation. If you give up, bring it down. They're probably going to take homers and bring it down, right? But if you don't give up anything, they're probably going to. They might take tactical, depending on the list. Uh, but at the same time, they do an incredible amount of damage and have a dynamic gameplay at the same time. You know, Chaos Space Marines as well. You know, maybe some of the more melee oriented lists these days are good at hammering into um, hammering to other melee components. You know, Chaos Knights, for example. You know, thinking about how you deal with a skew. You've got Tau. You've got Necrons. You can I mean, how do Tyranids play into all this as well? You know, so and in, 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 in such an open meta, I probably wouldn't, if I was going to give a definitive answer to Pumba, in such an open meta, and I think this meta is quite open apart from Eldar and maybe sitting above, a pep above everyone else a little bit. You know, you've got Gene Steeler called as well. It's important to have a very fundamentally strong strategy. And there are so many good strategies out there that people haven't thought of. You know, I played a game, um, played a couple of games of Guard recently. You know, pre balanced data state, this Guard list is 2,300 points. And then I'm playing, I'm playing it now. It's 2,000 points, 300 point difference. I'm playing, you know, zero indirect pieces, you know, like chimeras all over the place, you know, and I know that those are good game plans because I know they're actually putting 20 OC on something and then having a transport with four flamers. That's like a, that's 
that's fundamentally a good way to play the game as it is right now. And, and your opponent might not be experienced dealing with something like that. So I would say at the moment, you know, it's great to have a good game plan. Um, and you know what? There might be something that counters your list, but hey, in a big tournament, you're going to need a nice run anyway. I don't think there's really anything at the moment that is fundamentally great against every single army out there. Um, yeah. What do you guys think? You've, you've been playing. You must be playing some games too. What do you think about the, you know, the meta at the moment? Is there something that trumps it all? Uh, Elder? Do they not trump it all anymore? That's the question. Yeah. Necron Warriors? Do they not trump it all anymore? I guess everyone's gearing up against them, right? So... Yeah, that, that, that's that's a question that's out in the open. Uh, but I mean, I don't think there's like enough data to support. And uh, I, I'm kind of cheating because I can see what you've listed as your t- seven thingies. <laughs> and uh, number three relates to what I'm going to say as in, you know, playing locally doesn't really define the meta and what will or will not appear during such an event where you've got well, uh, approaching 1000 players. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll put a full stop there. Yeah. So, I'll read something out to you, or I can actually show you something. Uh, if it works, uh, share screen. And then share screen. Let's go to window, and let's go to, uh, I guess, this. No, this. All right, so... You should be seeing uh, yes. Turning Keeper. I'm familiar with this. Right. And if, <laughs> like, this is the team, Polish Team Championship uh, Turning Keeper page. Uh, so you have the leaderboard and you can see, like, which team won and so on. So my son, that is part of your team and that is part of uh, Contact Lost, took the first place, which is amazing. Uh, but then if we go to the individual leaderboard, uh, you'll see that there were two players who who brought home 100 points, so the, the maximum mm-hmm. points from five games. And we have uh, CSM, or Heretic Astartes, uh, at the top, which makes me believe that we are going to see a similar story like last year at the LGT, where we had <laughs> two amazing players, so Sako and Vic, playing CSM. Uh, I think... Uh, CSM, and they have multiple ways is how you can build the army, so I think they are one of the contenders for the top spot, uh, you know, if played well. And you, I guess you could say that about multiple armies, but uh, right now people seem to be understanding better uh, what needs to be done to counter Eldar, what needs to be done to counter Necrons. I mean, it's always hard to counter Eldar, but uh, people are building lists that are able to tackle those more or most popular factions. And then you have lists like this one, for example, with, you know, uh, I, I love this list because it's 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 very straightforward. There's like three Chaos Lords, Cultist Mob, Rhino, Chosen, 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 Fortfeed, 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 <laughs> Obliterators, <laughs> Obliterators, Warp Talons, Warp Talons, Warp Talons. It's just... <laughs> So simple, but so effective. And he brought 100 points with it. Uh, but you can build it with, uh, you know, with the accursed cultists, with torments that benefit from Abaddon's um, buffs and so on. Like three or four blobs of those 21 man uh, things uh, that are really hard to shift and can actually pack a punch. So uh, CSM look like a, a very strong army right now, and they look like something that could be an upset at uh, a major event like the LGT. Um, sure. Eldari, of course. Orcs. What I, well, yeah, sorry. Go what on. I was going to say is, if you look at mm-hmm. these, if you look at these results here, I could see any one of these factions winning LGT legitimately. Yeah, look, 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 look at the diversity. Yeah, what is, I mean, what is this? Yeah. Like the really, the really interesting stuff here is that, yeah, you know, what's this Adeptus Society's list? You know, is this Deathwing Knights? What is this Grey Knight list? Like, what is this Sororitas mm-hmm. list? You know, so like, you know, what I think, you know, obviously the things that are in the meta are in the meta for a reason, right? They're obviously very powerful. You know, that's that's they are decidedly good. But, you know, maybe you can take something that someone else has innovated upon, you know, be like, OK, that's really interesting. Like you look at this uh, Grey Knight list, for example, or you look at the sisters list and you go, OK, that's really interesting. What does this person, what matchups did he play? And actually, does that translate onto my tabletop? You know, and, you know, the most brilliant thing about all of these, uh, uh, all of these, you know, the Internet of things these days in the community is that you can actually just go message these people. Right. You, yeah, <laughs> you can message them. Or you can message Myson, or you can message Duda, and uh, and ask him like, you know, oh, you know, 
what did you think about this? And chances are, like, they're probably nice people. I'll probably just tell you, like, yeah, this matchup's really good. Or, yeah, you just do these three things there, you know, um, which is fantastic. But I over, I over, uh, I over jumped your point. You were, uh, you were going to ask me a question based on it. Uh, no, I basically wanted to say that at least by the, let's remember this was a team's event. So probably the people who got 100, they also got favorable matchups uh, if the pairings were done well. So, uh, we need to take you know take that with a maybe uh, like a degree or a pinch of salt or something, but in general it's looking like the meta is going in the direction we would like it to be. So there are multiple factions that can serve as contenders for the top spot because it would be really interesting to see. I don't know Brian Saib play his orcs right now instead of Eldar. I, I would like to see how he performs with 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 his orcs and whether he could potentially beat Eldar with, I don't know, overwhelming them or something, or playing to the mission. Uh, Necron players, definitely interesting. As you said, Grey Knights, uh, uh, Space Marines, all those armies are sort of looking equal. And yeah. if Eldar could be tweaked just a little bit more, Necrons maybe tweaked just a little bit more, it looks like we are, we are, we are getting close to a pretty balanced game after yeah. the last data slate. Yeah, look, I, I would completely agree. And, um, you know, one thing I would say is like, it's what, what's quite good is, you know, you look at these tournaments that are close to LGT and, and what I like to do is I like to, well, you know, I'm playing, I know I'm playing this faction, for example, you know, I'll go and look through those lists, even if they didn't perform well, I'll just go and look through them. And you, you'll find that some people that don't maybe, maybe have a losing record, right? Or just didn't do that well. You find sometimes that they, they come up with like really, in, like really ingenious solutions to things, you know, they're like, they're like, oh, they're playing this thing. And then you're like, the hell is that? and then they're like oh then they've got this enhancement on this thing and you're like oh that's actually really good you know it's like it's it's impossible to um to think of everything yourself as well so just but you know it's 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 a really really easy way to bootstrap your list um list designing if you just go look through some of these lists even though you might have your list already done you might have 90 percent of it locked in be like ah, uh, you know i want this i want that i want that and you have like 100 points of flex and you're like actually this guy like played that like oh okay you know may message them be like oh you know why do you have that for and they're like well, actually, I've got this unit just for this matchup right here, or when this thing comes out, you know, or like, you know, I've got this like, um, you know, Vanquisher Cannon for against this unit, or so, you know, whatever, for example, right? And then you go, oh, that's actually pretty nice because actually the way my games have played out, if I swap this unit and then I've got the hundred points, then actually I could afford one of that. Um, so there's lots of there's lots of gold dust to be found um, um, in Absolutely. all these ones, and and you know, the Polish nationals are, is obviously a great place to look as well, um, for sure. All right, let's jump to the next point on your list yeah point number three uh i've got in my notes play testing in a group and not thinking objectively about the meta i think this is one that we all succumb to isn't it you know we um look i play for what i probably think is the best team in the world <laughs> and um uh we have we have absolutely outstanding players but even we fall um fall to this little bit of group think at the same time as well you know like you know i'm quite active in the chat i'll be talking about oh well, what about this and then be like oh you know this army's really good because they do this this and this and then people start to group think around that a little bit and then they go oh yeah how do we beat that and then you know, it's like oh yeah but like and then they'll play a game they'll be like oh but how would it do against david's list and then you know um it's super easy to get that win especially when you've got a competitive team people are probably going to be gravitating towards um, the higher lists as well. And like none of us are full-time Warhammer players. So in, a, in an ideal world, we played full-time. We would go, okay, we all have our list, but like let's all practice backup lists to make sure we've discovered everything and stuff like that, you know, or, or a new codex comes out and we can all jump on that and, and build that as well. But um, it's really important to... Like you might be a player who's only played at your local gaming store, right? And you might play against the same like three-ish people all the time. And you might go... Okay, well, you know, David said like this unit's really good to play in a tournament because it's re it's a really it's a super good thing. Like for example, let's say I was playing um let's say I was playing Necrons. So I was playing Necrons at the Invitational as well, but I don't really know if I'm going to play them at the main event. Um, back before the balanced data slate, there was a thing called the um, Tomb Sentinel. Gave you a four up feel no pain against psychic attacks, right? So obviously that's really good against Necron uh, against Thousand Suns pre data slate. And um you know it's kind of like well if you play at your local game store you might you might never play against the Thousand Suns player, right? And then you go, wow, you know, in the last 10 games, like, this guy's been terrible. He's never done anything for me. And then, and then you, you know, you take him out. Then you hit the tournament. Round three, you play a 2-0 uh, T-Suns player. And then you're just like, wow, that's why I have the two in there. Because it makes that matchup fantastic, right? Um, so, you know, it's really important to, 
not only look at your games, but try and think about what the best armies in the meta are. Uh, and then, you know, try and think objectively like, okay, this unit's not good in this matchup, but its role is primarily for this, for example. You know, the the at the point where a unit has consistently underperformed game after the game, and it's not either scoring you points or dealing damage, then I think that's the point where you need to start seriously thinking, okay, this is really not working for me. Like, I like it on paper, but as soon as I use it once, it just goes up and, and dies. And it's like 280 points or 300 points, and it's like, oh, okay, you know, this is tough. Um so that's kind of the point we need to go, okay, this is maybe worth cutting from the list, for example. But yeah, it's really easy to get groupthink and, you know, kind of a way of, you know, getting around that is, um, so actually uh, I was chatting on the faction I was, I was chatting with someone from the Polish national team recently, uh, chatting with them just saying, um, hey, you know, I know you're playing the same faction as me. Like, do you mind if we just bounce some ideas off one another? And I just, you know, copy and paste my list. I was like, I really like this. This is working for me. Like, I'm thinking about cutting this. And then, you know, they came back and were like, oh, and, you know, I was like, oh, I wanted to try this unit out. And they came back to me like, oh, yeah, this is good. I like what you've done here. Like, I would try and get rid of this because of this logic here. And I would try and do this. And, and um, you know, and, and they were like, oh, because of this matchup and this matchup. And like, I hadn't even played, I haven't even practiced those matchups. And they were, and that's what they were focusing on. So it just goes to show that, you know, they obviously had access to those players in their team, which um, you should have played against, like, for them. And I've obviously got access to my players who are not playing that. So we kind of come to two list um, decisions. And then once you have both of that information, you can kind of join them together and say, well, how much of it, how much of his play test is going to be represented in the tournament? How much is mine is going to be represented in the tournament? And you get somewhere in between. And then, um, you know, that kind of comes into the list building as well. You just got to accept your decisions when you go into it as well. You know, you might say, I've got nothing good against Tau. And if I hit Tau, all right, you know, that's going to be a tough one. Um, because in this in this meta, I think it's really hard to be good against everything. Or, you know, if I hit um, if I hit Custodes or if I hit, um, you know, 13, 14 Knights, like, okay, that's just a tough one. Well, you know, it's, I, you know, even as someone like me, I think it's perfectly acceptable to take those risks sometimes. And, um, and a meta, you know, you got to have a good run as well to do well. So... That's kind of that's kind of it. So try and think about objectively what you actually think is strong. Like you know, look at these tier lists that come out, like uh, you know the Art of War one or maybe the Ignite one. Look at what's winning the tournaments and doing well. Chances are that's going to be pretty much represented at LGT as well for the for the middle of the pack run. That's going to be a pretty good representation. You know, obviously at the, at the very very top level, we're thinking about what individual players going to bring. You know, and and kind of at that level, like we're thinking about what the top twenty people might bring. But if you're if you're a middle of the road player, you know, hoping to go four and one, five and zero on a good day, then you want to think about what the middle of the pack is going and what the group mob mentality is is going to mm. kind of be as well, right? Because <laughs> um, like you know, I can beat you fourteen chaos knights. It's probably still good, right? No one's really chatting about them, but I don't know, like someone's probably going to make a run with 14 Chaos Knights. Um, chances are yeah. you might hit them. Yeah, I think so. 13 is the magical number now, just because of the <laughs> like, points yeah. changes and so on. But yeah. yeah. What, a, uh, what a great list design. <laughs> yeah. I know Vic is a huge fan. Uh, so, and yeah, coming back to what you said about, you know, chatting up the, the one of the Polish players, uh, I'm going to make an educated guess here that it was uh, Gitto, so probably that was like a 17-hour conversation about Necrons because he just doesn't <laughs> shut up. About uh, well, which, uh... by the way, which, by the way, I'll use as a segue to uh, our maybe not announcements, but like uh, what is it? The yeah, I'll call it announcements. So uh, a short break here at number three, uh, just to uh, mention a couple of things. Please do consider becoming our patron because. Uh, if you do, you might get access to uh, the like early access to our master classes that we do with our guests. And I have just released, or we have just released, uh, the master class with Gitto about Necrons that was available to our uh, patrons a month ago, right after the WTC. Uh, we released it now to to like the broader public viewing. So even though it's pre data slate. I think there is still a lot of merit in it. Uh, same goes for Pumbaa's Thousand Suns list, uh, or Thousand Thousand Suns masterclass that we recorded also just after the WTC. It's also available to everyone on the internet right now. So do after watching this, do go and watch that. Uh, with that in mind, I, I I think myself and Joker we we would like to thank everyone who is watching right now we would like to thank everyone who subscribed we have finally reached the magical number of 1000 subscribers we are yes. now at 1014 i think so if you're wondering being one of those people who liked reacted to the facebook post 
and who uh, uh, is a su subscriber of the channel. When is the raffle drawing? When will I get my reward? I think we can we can pro or award we can uh, promise that we will do this on Thursday. Joker, I don't know if you're you're there when we are recording with my uh, recording doing the live show with Manny and Ed Watts. I plan uh, to be there, but you know. So we might use five minutes of the of of the airtime that we have to uh, to do the actual raffle draw, and then we will name uh, the winner. So yeah, thank you to to everyone for helping us reaching that magical number. Um, was there anything else that I wanted to mention? I Joker, want did to I miss anything? add a. Uh, I don't think so. I want to add a digression. Uh, that seventeen-hour conversation joke doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, recording the Necron episodes or the Ghetto episodes actual took uh, took actual five hours <laughs> sitting down straight with him. It was great fun. Jesus yeah, God. and there's a running joke about recording and uh, a podcast around Necrons with Ghetto in Polish, but uh, you know Ghetto said that it, it would take around forty hours, so I don't think there is anyone who is actually willing to yeah, take up the, the challenge. The joke is every time you mention it, you have to double the time that was mentioned previously. So we're now looking at like four hundred hours. <laughs> <laughs> you could probably still pull it off. But it's an thing absolute is... madman. The thing is, the guy really knows his stuff when it comes to Necrons. So I strongly recommend that if you want to know what the Necrons are able to pull off, do watch uh, the two recordings that we had with him, because we, that, that, that was a two-parter. The first part was about his performance at the WTC, and the second part goes deeper into his list, uh, but also some digressions on what is strong, what isn't, and so on. And as I said, there is still a lot of merit in it, even despite the, the data slate, because I don't think the Necrons actually changed a whole lot. I spoke to Gito about that, and he said, yeah, some of the things are no longer valid, but, the, you know, the the... the the, the essence of it is still there. So give that a chance. Uh, you might learn something before your next major event. Uh, back to our conversation. Uh, number two? Yeah. Before number two, make sure you drop a like, comment, and subscribe. for well, the good content that these guys are putting out. You know, the, I know the Contact Loss Network is getting bigger. It's good to see you guys doing good things as well. And uh, they genuinely have like a, a, an array of, apart from myself, like great guests come on and like deliver actually good content. So, um, you know, it's great. I was listening to the Nassim, uh, Nassim one while I was in, in Santorini because I had my list submission. And then, uh, yes, talking to Gito uh, whilst I was in Santorini trying to get some resemblance of a good list going. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't even know. <laughs> we'll see. By the way, um, tomorrow we are talking to... Uh... One of the Whitaker brothers, I think, and on yes, Thursday, Will again. Yep. Uh, with Will. Uh, yep. So yep. Will is going to be our guest tomorrow, and then on Thursday we are talking to the duo of Glasshammer um, colleagues or friends, so Mani Chima and Ed Watts. So do awesome. do plan your evenings for that. I'm gonna drop the the teasers at some point, so you know what time it is, but. Yeah, we're the next couple of weeks are going to be packed with content before the LGT. So yeah. yeah, stay tuned, subscribe, like, press the bell button to get the notifications, and uh, enjoy the content. Hopefully, we meet your expectations about it. Uh, yeah. David, back to you. Where were we? Number two. Number two. Mm -hmm. Man, this one has lost me so many games. Oh my god, most of the games I've lost actually is probably probably because of this one. Uh, number two, I've got uh, being overconfident slash playing the player instead of the matchup as two sides of the same coin really isn't it uh you know being overconfident or lose your games very quickly that's the quickest way to lose a game is to be overconfident you know i've got this uh story <laughs> thanks Mick. i've got this story um at uh, you may have heard before but uh, i played at las vegas last year i can stay a uh, lovely guy called chase um and that was the quintessence of being overconfident you know he was playing Ganari. i was like this is an unlosable matchup for me you know uh sorcerer's prowess like nuke everything play aggressive done uh you know but player plays terrain he had three d cannons i was jet lagged to crap and um yeah just played super aggressive uh played way too cocky forgot about the fundamentals of the game um and uh chase played super well as well which did not make it easy um and um yeah there's a there's a funny uh, funny story of Vic and Nassim um 
watching uh watching the game and then me doing the classic uh rubbing my neck and then uh that's usually when, <laughs> when things are not going well for me if you ever see me play so um yeah look getting overconfident is the worst way to lose a game i think and everyone's gonna learn, i think everyone's gonna learn that lesson you know i have the type of personality where perhaps i have to learn it three or four or five different times but um you know like uh so i went to wtc to play recently and um uh and Hey, blood hungry and blood absolutely yeah blood and hungry. so um mm. uh you know i played at wtc recently and uh i just tried to take that as an absolute learning opportunity uh i played against a lovely guy called jeremy martino round one uh against australia and um you know we had a fantastic game and i was just i was really worried about uh getting really outplayed and outmatched and had a few you know i missed five charges on turn four which given that was my biggest unit into his biggest unit was pretty detrimental ended up losing that one 12 eight but i think i walked away from it really happy knowing that you know win or lose i played well and win lose play, you know doesn't matter if you win doesn't matter if you lose just try and play well is the best mentality to adopt here because you know overconfidence will cause you to play sloppily uh, when you otherwise should be taking your time and you don't know oftentimes how good players can be as well you know because we're all fundamentally playing the same game like my models can only do the same as other people's models you know they can only move five inches if they move five inches. So that's, we're all bound by the fundamentals of the game. But the flip side to this one is that, um, and I've had this a lot, uh, you know, particularly as, as I started winning a bit more, you know, you'd, you'd, you know, you'd go to a game and some people would just say, oh man, you know, David Gale, I've lost this one, you know, like, oh, there's no way I'm going to win this one. And every single time I've encountered this, uh, I encountered this even at the finals of a major, um, you know, guys said, oh, there's no way I'm winning this matchup. Um, and I said, look, there is no way you'll win this matchup with that attitude. You might as well go home now. Like, but I'm begging you to come and play and and play well because there's you've you've actually got every single chance of winning this one. And I've I've had I've had people that say, um, there's no way I'm going to win this matchup in a matchup that's good for them. And I'm like, man, come on, you know, you're never going to win with that attitude. So every time I've tried I've tried to tell people, look, with that attitude, you're never going to be in the game. So just remember that, you know, whilst I might have won tournaments before, great. But at the same time, my models can only do everything that they're describing. So it doesn't really matter like if I'm David Gaylord or not, you can still be in the game to, to win it. But if you're going into it already defeated, it's going to make it five times easier for me because, you know, it's also, you know, it's no secret that Warhammer is a, a social game as well. And I think some of the top players um, are socially quite, um, quite, you know, um, artisan, right? They're quite good um, at picking up on social cues. It's not something about the game that gets discussed a lot, but uh, I think one of my strengths is, is the social side of Warhammer, and particularly, you know, it's you know, it's it's a bit like poker, but it's a bit not like poker. You know, you can get a read on people if you think, oh, this is how they understand the matchup. You know, they think I'm going to be aggressive, but I'm actually going to be defensive and and etc. You know, all the way to secondary. So, um, you know, at the best, you know, the best thing to do is just be a complete statue most of the time, right? Um, and you know, what that means is hard to read people, but at the same time, it means that you're just there to play the game. Think about it logically. You know, my six crisis suits don't do more damage than, you know, Vic VJ's six crisis suits on average. You know, like my dice don't roll better than anyone else. And in fact, most of the time they're all fucking shit. So, <laughs> um, um, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's a big part of it. And so, you know, always take every experience, experience as a learning experience. You know, I've got, um, after I lost Chase there, we had a, I've got signed UKTC mats and gold pens where I get all my favorite matches and opponents to sign them. And uh, the one that I learned from Chase is that victory is earned. You know, you need to earn the, every single victory in a game. And as soon as you start getting complacent, things get out of control. And then you're just like, oh, man, why was I sloppy about that? Or, um, you know, um, even in my game versus Ennis Wilson at Warhammer Fest, like I could have won, but, you know, I made a sloppy mistake. I didn't, I just didn't measure one thing. And I was like, oh, like, <laughs> you know, I think about that one. Um, so, you know, it goes all the way up to the games um, that mean the most. Um, even the games you take... Um, really seriously and that's that's all about being getting stamina in a tournament i think um you know playing the longevity of a tournament is having the ability to be focused you know whether or not it's like before a finals game so weird story um every, before every single cut or every single finals i go to the bathroom uh i splash water on my face um i just take some time out do some jumping jacks some press ups um just to you know get myself and you know just to re just a bit of a reset right um mm -hmm. you know we'll do a walk around the building outside um and you know just, just things like that if you need to go do that put the clock on you go to the bathroom put some water on your face you know um and that's um yeah you've got to respect your opponent's potential because 
you know, the chances are when um, a big tournament and you're a good player too, everyone is gunning for you as well. Um, you know, everyone wants, that, <laughs> um, you know, everyone wants that win against you or something like that, right? So um, means kind of more. So there's two sides to that coin, and you've got to be really careful at um, making sure that you know you're not going to be on that humbled side, um, which is it's going to happen at some point. But um, you know, you got to make sure it's a it's a humbling lesson in the in the right way, not because you've just made a silly mistake and you've played like a like a like a nuns. All right. Uh, I, I, I want... say, sorry, on, I yeah, have David, to comment on. on one thing. I mean, David, you say that David Gaylord's six crisis suits do the same amount of damage as, on average, as say Vic Vijay's ones, but there are Facebook pictures of you approaching an oven with uh, dice laid out on the tray, ready to <laughs> bake. <laughs> so I wouldn't be so sure about that one. <laughs> Uh, for those that don't know, there was a there was a in the WTC banter um, channel. Yes, I, I had a um, there was a photo of me and a baking tray with some dice. Uh, that's a bit of a joke. So. <laughs> that's yeah. so good. It is of course a joke. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I definitely agree with with your point there. Uh, I think I've been there as well, uh, at least with the part of underselling uh, myself. Yeah. Um, but uh, you said what was the exact wording? Playing the player instead of the matchup was a mistake. I th although. I feel like there are at least some players that actually do that. Would you say that's yeah. kind of unsportsmanlike, or uh, uh, is it well, well, okay, viable because yeah, like, yeah. I mean, so, so this advice you know, is, anything goes. Yeah, I mean, so this advice is kind of the middle of the road. You know, for the for ninety nine percent of cases, this is going to be true. But let's be honest: if I play against Alexander Seiko, he's probably going to unga bunga me and play super aggressive, right? Like, I've never <laughs> seen him play the other way. Like, the team, probably going to play the same way, right? Like, Liam, probably going to play the same way. Um, you know, Vic, probably going to play towards the end of the game, maybe, right? So, um, you know, there's, every player's got their kind of play style as well. Um, but for the, for the average player, for the majority of players, you know, you know, just rely on the way that you think the matchup should be played. And if you've come to the right conclusion of how the matchup should be played and your opponent deviates from that, that means they're playing suboptimally. And that means that's where the capitalizations come in as well, right? Um, so, yeah, yeah, of course, um, play the player to some extent. But that, you know, I played very aggressive for a very long time. And players at Warhammer Fest thought I was going to play extremely aggressive. And then I did the exact opposite and played extremely defensive. So it can kind of bite you in the ass at the same time. And I guess that point could actually be applicable to factions as well in terms of matchups, right? Because you can also yeah. go overconfident having a good matchup just into the faction, not necessarily the player, and then actually, you know, bounce back from it. Yeah, no, no. Uh, and yeah, exactly true as well. You, you got to respect, um, you know, if you're playing against a um, maybe, maybe a weaker opponent than your normal practice partner, then you've got to play the same way against the weaker opponent than you do your top practice partner. Because, you know, to just say, oh, this is a weaker player, I can lean in on them more, isn't necessarily true, specifically in the early game. Because if in the early game you overextend to play aggressive, then all of a sudden they play really well, then uh, all of a sudden you're like, well, okay, I've overextended. And then that's the hardest spot to dig yourself out of as well, right? So, yeah, I mean, that's that's happened to me as well. You know, at London Open, I took uh, against Dan Whitaker, actually, I took Assassinate when I should have just taken R&D. Uh, trying to go for 100 points, thinking I could lean on that matchup and uh, ended up losing by like three points or something. Um, so that's a good example of where it can happen as well, right? And I wanted to to add something to that point because uh, the point you, you made is uh, about being overconfident. I think we can add a little twist to it and also say, at least from my point of view, also don't approach the game insecure. Because, yes. like, I, I, I have this, and I had this in our last game, last uh, testing game against Joker. I tend to like approach games kind of insecure in that when the game unfolds, and you know the, the dice don't go the right way, or I don't know, hit, which they Joker, never do in your case, <laughs> or Joker's or Joker saves, like he he saves like a fucking monkey, and, and I'm <laughs> unable to touch his Magnus. Um, what happens in my brain is that I start thinking, oh my god, I need to do something, or I need to start rolling better, because he will think of me as a weak player. And I'm probably not the only one out there who has that problem, who basically uh, becomes insecure, or you know, insecure about being judged by the opponent that you know I, I didn't put in a good game, or my skills are way higher than what I am displaying right now. I don't stuff like that. Uh, yeah. My advice to that would be always try and bring your best to the table 
and in that way you you won't have any regrets you won't have any afterthoughts or second thoughts that you know you you, you haven't done your best or or that you are being misjudged essentially yeah. bring your best put your best on the table and then if you are a skilled player or if you are showing the best of your skill and at the same time you didn't you, you didn't show that you are overconfident or insecure your opponent will probably remember you for the level of play that you know the 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 positive level of play that you showed or positive attitude that you showed on the table not for being a a, a salty bitch like myself for example yeah. <laughs> when i start complaining about dice rolls or his saves or something like that so take that into consideration because i think that point can be uh, interpreted in two ways being overconfident is good but also being insecure might not end up well because for your opponent because your opponent will just see that you're salty and that takes away all the joy from the game that you yeah. you two are supposed to be enjoying. Yeah, and and look, I think um, you know, yeah, yeah. The flip side to that is, of course, is that um, who cares what your opponent thinks of you? You know, they're just they're just some guy, right? Um, you know, which is you know, they might think you're terrible. Okay, that's fine. But like, I think one of the leading indicators of what makes it, it, one of the leading indicators of a player who will be rapidly improving is someone who openly and objectively discusses after the game and analyzes the game, you know, post fact, right? And you may play like crap, right? And be like, okay, well, I play like crap. Like, and but you know, maybe talk to your opponent. Like, oh, you know, okay, obviously I played like crap. You know, this part went wrong, this part went wrong. But like, I think if I did this or if I did that and analyze it, and then be like, and just be like, what did you think? You know, I did really poorly. And and the first thing they'll go is, you yeah, obviously you made that big mistake there. But they might also say like, actually, you know, most people don't play like this. But actually, you played really well doing this, and I wasn't expecting that. So. You know, just because you make one big mistake this isn't representative of your skill, of course. And we all make big mistakes, right? Um, that's kind of that's kind of how it happens. So, yeah, I mean, try and th think a bit objectively and analytically about the game. You know, I, I just had a game earlier today with my teammate, and um, you know, we we must have spent you know half an hour talking about oh, what about this, and then like this, and then oh, if you do this, and then that, you know, and and thinking about all oh, the positioning of this and this and. And you know, oh, but what if I do this? And what about what about if they have like this variant of the build, for example? Like, how does that interact with this? And um, you know, all of those parts are super important uh, in, in developing as well. And just trying to think about, okay, yes, like I did play like this, and actually that's suboptimal. Like I shouldn't do that. And not thinking like, oh man, my teammate must think I'm like kind of bad because I made that mistake, right? Or my opponent might think I'm kind of bad. Just think about it as an opportunity to learn, right? Like, you know, fool me once, that's fine. But if you make the same mistake over and over again, then <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Maybe that's uh maybe that's a bit um of a doozy. Yeah. I think Sam Harris, um, Simon Harris, has a good point here as well. Is that you know, and if you're a weaker opponent, you might bend to your opponent, your opposition. If you're a weaker player, you might bend to your opponent's will a little bit, right? And uh, I think you know everyone who's a very very good player will probably you know is always able to recognize when your opponent is maybe a little bit under the pump and maybe a little bit out of the depth, and you can bend them to your will a little bit, but. It's the people that don't bend uh, that are, are really good as well. That focus on their own gameplay as well, you know. And it's the people that don't bend are always the people that focus on the points. As as weird as that sounds, right? The people that you go, I'm going to put this guy under the pump, uh, are always the people like, well, actually, you know, David, you get four points there, but I'm getting three points here, and actually, I'm going to get that. I'm going to get that there, and you know, and then you know, and then the game ends, and you won by eight points, and they go, well, actually, if this thing kind of went sideways, like you're in a little bit of trouble, and you're like, yeah, it's true, you know. But it didn't. <laughs> exactly right. So it's um, mate, this is this is a huge one. I think is developing as a player is kind of mm -hmm. understanding, you know, the game, and and I think you know it happens on all you know all levels, right? Like esports, or if it's magic, or if it's any other competitive sport that you might play is having self-confidence whether you know this applies to everything in life of course as well um could be your job could be your relationships you have with other people uh everything it's the most important mindset to adopt is the uh, minds open mindset of willingness to learn i think uh and and always going into a situation thinking that you can learn something uh because 40k will allow you to learn something from every game no matter how how good or bad you are yeah, cover a lot of ground then, on that one yeah and then if you get to play one of the let's call them celebrities those people usually play on a, on a high level. Sometimes they have like a coaching service or uh, a podcast that is aimed at like li today. I listened to um, uh, Aiden Smalley uh, yeah. talking about Beth Guard, for example, and he's not a coach per se, but the last series of episodes of his podcast are essentially about teaching people how to play Death Guard. So uh, if you face him at the tournament, I imagine if you ask him, you know, what could I have done better? He will just sit down with you and will point out the things that 
you know that 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 that, that where there is room for improvement. So don't waste that opportunity. If you do meet those people, don't just gloat if you I don't know if you beat the celebrity or you know uh, feel insecure if you are beaten by a uh, by a celebrity. But just ask them to sit down with you and you know ask what could have been done better. Is it the list building that 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 sucked a little bit? Was it the target priority? Was it the missions that were, could have been done better? Or the, a combination of all of those? Don't waste the opportunities to, to learn from yeah. the greatest. Like, I mean, I'm just just on that last point is um, I actually have a notepad. So when I when I really need to know I need to practice and create my rule sets, uh, I, I literally have a Word document where I go, against this, like, this is the important thing to note. Like, literally just write them down. And I try and memorize that whole thing um, of like, okay, this happens, you know, Make sure against this army, you can put one thing out and then you need to have two tanks to counter punch or, or something like that, you know? Like, uh, writing these things down is, you know, super, that'll, for me, that's just how I need to learn. Uh, drill it into my brain as much as possible through so many losses and then, and then finally get good. So, yeah, I mean, there's lots to cover on that one. Uh, developing as a player is a really, I don't think it's been solved by any means as well. And we all develop differently as well. So, but um, making sure you're going with the right attitude is really important, nah, no matter what level uh, of skill you're at. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Uh, time is passing really quickly, so let's jump to uh, to yeah. the last one. The last one, not necessarily the most important, mm -hmm. but uh, this one is the fundamental one about how you should play the game. I think it applies over every single edition. Doesn't matter what the state of the game is, the balance of the game. If Leviathan Warriors are dominating, or Aldari's Wraith Cannon is you know totally broken, uh, this fundamental still apply. And top players and everyone still gets this wrong. The notes I've got written down is number one, not understanding which player has to be the aggressor. This is so fundamental about how the game plays because this is once again, like if you focus on the points versus if you just focus on how units destroy each other, you're going to get a completely different understanding about how the game's going to be played. So, once again, take this back to Warhammer Fist because this is the best example of this. I played a list that gave up like 30 points to bring it down. Take bring it down, sure, whatever, right? That's, you know, everyone's going to take that. They look at my list and go, I'll take Bring It Down, of course, right? Because this whole thing. And it looks super aggressive. And then the very first, I would stage aggressively, and then I had Redeploy, and then Redeploy ultra defensively, and then just use my little non-Bring It Down units to score 87 points. They took Bring It Down. They get two points on it. They're going to get like 78 points because they have a secondary that relies on them aggressing me. And then they deployed such that they thought I was going to be aggressive, but then they didn't have the opportunity to take advantage of their secondary which requires them to kill me so that's obviously quite that's a multi-layered version of you know who needs to be the aggressor or not uh but in 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 today's matchups is exactly the same right if you focus on maybe you take an army which has fixed secondaries okay do you need to be the aggressor in that well i don't know it depends on what fixed secondaries you take you might take um you know storm hostile objective and you might take a obviously homer again right okay well i mean most of those are pretty you need to be the aggressive at some point but if your opponent is going to be on tacticals, then chances are they're going to be the ones that are going to need to bully you. So they're going to have to push into you. So if you've got units that um, you know can counter punch, then you need to save them for counter punching because eventually it might not happen on turn one or two, but it'll happen at some point. It might happen on turn four and five. But then you need to sandbag those units for for their role because that's where they're going to need to be um, you know coming into play, no matter how late they are. And if your opponent's supposed to be the aggressor and they're only pushing into you on turn five, then they're probably losing. But at the same time, if your opponent has a really strong secondary plan, then you need to understand, okay, I need to be the aggressor in this matchup, which means that you're going to need to be thinking about things and staging things such in a way that you might need to take a risk to then make something pay off and happen. And when you're the aggressor, you need to understand which of your units need to collapse into your opponent's units in the correct way. Uh, you know, things like sequencing, math on the you know, numbers expected outcome, you know, knowing the math ahead of time is really important. You know, having your list builder brown terrain, if you're going to be the aggressor, is really important. You know, how your transports can fit into ruins is really important and what angles they can hide from. You know, all that stuff's really important. Or, you know, if you're not going to be the aggressor ever, you know, you need to know, okay, well, where can I get shot from? And, and what are my defensive profiles? And if I've got this average expected outcome, where am I going to do this? And what units do I need to have to make sure that I can score my secondaries consistently? Uh, you know, these things are really important. And just, and just thinking about, you know, just sit down at the start of the game being going, is my opponent going to pressure me or am I going to pressure my opponent in a, in a units kill unit um, kind of aspect of looking at things. And then in secondaries, pro primary, 
primarily, uh, you know, you need to think about, am I going to be the person who's denying primary or is my opponent going to be um, <laughs> the person who's denying primary? Just take aggressors and you can always be the aggressor. That's not a bad strategy. If you're going to LGT and you're playing aggressors and Deathwing Knights, chances are you're probably going to be the aggressor. Uh, and that's a good uh, good way to follow it as well, right? So, yeah, obviously, um, you know, as we talked about earlier, um, this ties into, I think, number seven, where you have a clear game plan. If you're the aggressor, that's a clear game plan, right? And naturally, being a very aggressive player is actually, I, I think, is a very good way to get qu good quickly uh, and to perform well in tournaments quickly is having very aggressive lists, um, lists that can really push people under the pump to make mistakes, having a clear, aggressive game plan. Because uh, I think it's, it's a bit... It's, it's not easy to execute an aggressive game plan, but I think it's the most direct one that people can learn from um, primarily as well. You know, 15 Chaos Knights. Okay, there are some elements of defensivity to that, but, you know, it's clear, like, kind of how that should play, right? Um, or, you know, uh, aggressors and a land raider or, or something like that as well. So understanding where you are relative to your opponent and how things are supposed to flow in terms of my opponent needs to attack me or I need to defend against my opponent uh, or I need to shut down this line of sight because my opponent excuse me my opponent needs to be aggressive so i need to shut down this line of sight so they can't stage into this ruin if i go first you know that's a great way of nullifying your opponent's aggression right because you're shutting down the lanes of staging uh you know rogal dawns big tanks like that's a really common thing especially when i play an army like guard which i love uh you know i know that okay the big the big pieces what i call the rooks you know the rooks need to be on the edges of the board and the rooks need to have the clear files to operate in so that they can shoot down the file and you need to know every single map, every single mission, every single matchup, where the rooks need to be placed to shut down those lines. And if they can't pass, no pawns can go past the rook. Well, the king can never go past the rook, right? So um, that's kind of the way I think about it as well. So yeah, the understanding, do you need to push? Do your opponent need to push? Am I mono red or am I, you know, am I mono blue? Uh, as, the, as the magic the gathering uh, kind of term, right? My control or aggressive. <laughs> being the aggressive is always the most fun. Yeah, being aggressive is good fun. Yeah, and I guess this is fairly liquid, right? So you might want to start a game uh, defensively, but then seeing how the game unfolds, you might switch into this sort of aggressive mode, or you might set up for, say, three rounds, and then uh, at the start of round four, you, you go into that aggressive uh, play style, but you need to know what you can allow yourself to do. Or not. So, but you'll see by the points, by the the missions you have drawn, by what your opponent is doing, that um, whether there is place for that or not. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, and and kind of mid round liquidity, uh, liquidly speaking, is you know obviously related to the points as well, right? You might have drawn great secondaries, he might have drawn a couple of blanks early, and then they you might go, oh, actually mid round. Normally, I'd be aggressive, but you know I'm playing world eaters, but actually I've got such a lead on the points here that he's going to be coming to. Um, come into some objectives as well. And if you're both playing tactical, thinking about the objectives that your opponent might be drawing, like no prisoners or overwhelming force, is a big part of that as well, right? So thinking, actually, it's all right if I cool off and become a bit defensive because then I'm going to stage into a ruin and then he needs to come and hold primary and score on objectives and then I can um, get the turn to come back into him. Zig when they zag, as I say. And uh, sometimes you see a game of 40k when when your opponent zagged instead of zigging if you know what i mean and everything just looks just off on the on the on everything right it's like wow you kind of did everything the exact opposite timing that you should have uh but if you actually zigged when you should have zagged then actually the game would have flown a lot more naturally uh things would have gone a lot better but you were just like a half step off or every single time yeah so uh, I, I want to throw a question out there because, uh, again, uh, while walking my dogs today, I, I listen to a bunch of podcasts. I just devour them one by one. And I listen to the German-speaking podcast, uh, uh, Breaking Heads, with yep. Fred Otto. Uh, and he had two guests. Uh, they were discussing how to play the missions and so on. And, and Fred said that, uh, that his philosophy is, first of all, focus on the battle itself, whether your models can kill the other models, because and like he upholds this this old truth that dead models don't score. And he builds his list around that. And only then, knowing that he has this absolute dominance on the battlefield, does he start thinking about missions and so on and so on. Do you think that this is still the way to go? In the light of you know what we've been discussing, uh, not understanding which player has to be aggress uh, the aggressor, is being the aggressor for five turns also a solution? Or 
it, it, it's a waste of resources, waste of time. What do you think? Yeah, look, I think... Here, here, so I won't answer your question directly, but what I'll say is this, is that as a player, I improved so much when I shifted from that mentality into the mentality of focusing on points and differential. That's that's where I I finally... That's where things really started to click for me. The whole circle of Warhammer started to fill in. When I stopped thinking about, well, if I just crush my opponent, these units need to line up to this one. I've got these defensive profiles against this edge of the meta. This is where it needs to happen. My, if you know, if I just line up everything correctly and I know the math on how all the units interact and the output and um, and defensive profiles, I'll be fine. When I stop thinking like that, or when I not own, when I stop only thinking like that primarily, and I started thinking about, well. You score seven points primary, then you score three, and then the board state. You know, some of my friends, uh, Vic is great like this, sees the game in a fundamentally different way. You know, sees the game uh, as kind of areas of control in the board state, which is uh, another way you can think of things, right? You know, that's representative of how the game is going to a certain extent as well. Uh, so there's lots of different ways of seeing the game. And I, I think if you only see it through one lens, that's got to be you're not getting the most out of your game, I think. That's that's I guess that's the way I would say it is that there are so many ways of thinking and so many, clearly so many players have been really successful through that way that just thinking about one thing first is not necessarily the you might not be seeing the whole picture. Um, Fred's obviously an incredible player though, so um, you know advice that Fred's gives is going to be is going to be good as well. But I think you know and and to Fred's point, I think that's a really good way of entering the game and succeeding and doing well um, early on is knowing all those things, knowing that. You know, my AP one against whatever is not going to really work it that well, or my my damage two against five up no pain two in models is like very inefficient. You know, basic things like that are obviously very good. But you know, if if your opponent's models are scoring points, then hey, you you still got to score points at the end of the day. So, yeah. um, I would I would try and focus on the points, focus on the differential, and you know, it's as forty k has developed. You know, not enough players I think do this as well. You know. Manny Chimi had a brilliant list of Warhammer Fest 2, which was basically to run on Stubborn Defiance at the end of the tournament and get a uh, Warp Ritual with one character as well, uh, which, um, you know, is a brilliant strategy when you think about it because that was on no one's radar, of course. Uh, and, um, you know, that just goes to show, right? He's not thinking about, you know, killing your opponent at all. And he could have won the whole mm -hmm. thing. So, um, yeah, there's lots of different ways of thinking about it just because a lot of people go, this unit's really busted or this unit's really good. You know, obviously it makes it strong, but um, there's a lot of depth in these codexes too that, you know, isn't out there like, you know, just take guard, for example. I just sat down and I had a four-hour playing ride and I just looked at the guard points changes and I was like, mate, none of these units got played. But these units are great. Like, the Vanquisher went down like 35 points. Mm. And I was like, that's fantastic. And I and I wrote a list and it was 2,300 points pre-balance. Pre and I was like, okay. And I was like, is anyone playing guard at LGT? Probably not, but I'm telling you now, that list is pretty good. Uh, you know, so... You know, stuff like that as well. And, and you know, thinking about how you can score points um, on top of that as well. It's, you know, built into a list like Guard really well, for example, right? So, um, yeah, input, output is important. But I think looking at how you can control areas of space and how you can negate your opponent from doing things is, is so important. Like, obviously, opponent's models can't score if they're dead. Great. But there's other ways you can nullify your opponent's army rather than just them being dead, of course, right? You can have Overwatch or, you know, you can shut down a lane of fire for a staging unit or you can have defensive profile that nullifies that. So, yeah. A lot of uh, stuff to think about, to be perfectly honest. Overload. <laughs> so, so, everyone, this was uh, David's top seven mistakes that people make. Let's just reiterate really quickly. Number seven was building an army list that doesn't have a clear game plan. Number six, tournament prep, not putting models on the train and trying to find interesting uh, combos for the train. Uh, five, not playing the entire game out, not thinking about the differential scoring. Four, knowing the math. Three, playtesting in a group and not thinking objectively about the meta. Two, being overconfident. And we added that also uh, insecure might, might, uh, might also work. Playing uh, the player instead of the matchup. And then number one, not understanding which player has to be the aggressor. David, do we still have time for a bunch, like three or four listener questions. Go for it. Go for it. I All want right. To Let's... add that surprisingly, uh -huh. not bringing flip flops and chugging too many beers did not make David's list, uh, to my dismay, but uh, <laughs> I guess they are too obvious to be discussed. Yes. Yeah. Probably. All right. Let's start with a question from the chat just uh, to entertain Simon, who uh, 
hopefully he is still with us because he asked that question like an hour ago. Um, so where did we go? Uh, oh, okay. With new towering rules, do you feel like Canis Rex is best used as a hidden counter assault in the UKTC behind mid ruins or aggressive? Uh, oh boy, um, that's a very uh, specific question. Um, look, all I know is Canis Rex is probably the best knight pre balanced data slate, and he actually went down in points. So, like, okay, you're probably still playing Canis Rex. Uh, and I think, you know, the rapid ingress play for Canis Rex is probably one of the better plays uh, to make of him as well. Uh, you know, the UKTC midboards are quite dense as well. So, like, Canis Rex is a fantastic example of what I was talking about. You know, where can you hide Canis Rex, um, you know, on the midboard where you can only get shot from, like, one angle where they have to expose something where you'd have something to counter shoot it, right? Oh, that's fantastic, right? Like, these are the things you need to be thinking about. And, you know... If you, if you look at the mission pack and go, I can probably win round one or two regardless of who I play against. And then you have got Kane restriction on these three, four, five missions. Um, and, you know, okay, they might not be good on this mission, but I'll wrap it in Gress in there. And then I'll play, you know, these two missions he's fantastic on because I found out this one little terrain um, gimmick that I can put them on. Like, it's a fantastic way. Uh, breaking models like that is a really important way that, uh, you know, everyone overlooks as well, including myself. Like, it's really important. Mm-hmm. All right, next question uh, is from a person that you know way too well, but still, uh, Vic asks a question or two questions. Uh, first of all, why are some players able to sit at around 90% win rate at GT plus events like yourself uh, in an environment where people have access to all the best lists via online content and tournament results? If we're all using the same rules, what's creating such an extreme win rate for some players, especially when compared to top players' win percentage in other games or esports? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm actually a huge um I'm a huge StarCraft fan. So if anyone uh, if anyone knows me Thank knows you. that I watch ASL, I watch DSL literally for 15 years. Um, <laughs> like I, I was literally watching Brew War today. Um, and you know that's a game where people don't have enormously high win rates against uh, certain matchups. Uh, you know, Flash, the greatest player of all time. Uh, you know, arguably the greatest esports player across any game of all time as well. You know, it doesn't hover around 90% win rate as well. So, um, you know, I do think Warhammer is, is relatively balanced. Um, uh, and, you know, at the top level, people are playing, you know, uh, relatively balanced armies relative to, you know, relative to one another. It was too, terribly poor. But I think what it comes down to essentially is that with a game like Warhammer, even though there is luck involved, there's an enormous amount of skill expression. So I think... For example, let's take a game like League of Legends, right? Like, oh, no, Dota 2. So I was, like, quite a good Dota 2 player, playing, like, a sponsored team, for example. And the difference between myself and people that went to the international or people who I played against is enormous. And I think the current maturity level of Warhammer, as it is, players are actually not that good. It sounds bizarre, but relative to how good people are at other esports games, Warhammer players are not that good. Um, for example, I don't think I would be able to compete at the top level, if the top level was the same as it was in an esports level right now, I'm just being realistic. Mm -hmm. Like, because there is so much to be good at the game, it's crazy. And, you know, maybe the smartest people don't play Warhammer, right? Um, and so, you know, I'm just a reflection, or all these 90% win rate players are just a reflection of the current um, uh, maturity of current competition players. But there will be players that will come along that will be so much better than we are that it's mind blowing. Um, so, that's that's a little bit of a cop-out answer. A couple of things that work really well is that I think if you look at a lot of these top players, you'll notice they are quite socially in tune players as well. I think the social side of Warhammer is something that doesn't get talked about at all, but is hugely important. I think it's a little bit of a secret source that no one at the top really talks about, if I'm being honest. Um, so that's a big part of it. Uh, and yeah, just that there's a, there's a huge amount of skill expression, obviously, over the entire course of the game as well. And that top players probably put in more effort than a lot of other players or they're solidified within teams and gaming environments that allow them to compete well like you know um you know early in brood war you had like the kesper houses uh and then you had the houses or gaming houses for um you know starcraft 2 and whatnot and mm -hmm. these players oftentimes sunk um you know rose to the top actually so that's kind of like the hyperbolic time chamber for a uh, DBZ reference. Um, you know, that's where you can intensify your training. And that, what that does is it actually locks out a lot of the other players from gaining that information that you have in the team. And it, it, and it uh, intensifies the training that you have as well. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's going to stay that way for long. Because as we get more and more players in the tournament, I think the skill gap is becoming closer. Uh, but I still think there's so much room to improve. Like, I think I, 
it sounds crazy, but I don't. I genuinely don't think I, like I'm that good at the game compared to what 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 actually being very good at the game uh, is probably like. Realistically speaking, yeah, it still would probably take me, you know, uh, a couple of days in the time chamber to actually reach those levels. So, <laughs> so you know, With that attitude, of course, it will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Vic had a follow up question though. Um, what mentality or approach do you take if you are paired into one of those ninety percent? Uh, yeah. Oh man. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a, been a bit of transition from, uh, for me. Right. So, um, early on a big accomplishment I tried to make was I wanted to win a major. I wanted to win a major first GTA I played it. Um, well, that wasn't COVID. Uh, I won. Um, and then I really wanted to win a major and it eluded me a couple of times, lost to Mike Porter undefeated at the Goonhammer open, um, like hundred players by one victory point on the tiebreaker. It's like, great. Uh, but, um, you know, before that, I just told myself, um, you know, I'm David Gaylard. Like, they've got to be worried about playing me, you know? And that's kind of the <laughs> the phony mentality that I, you know, fake it till you make it, right? That's kind of the mentality <laughs> I adopted, right? I was like, what do you mean they, I'm worried about playing them? They've got to be worried about playing me, you know? Um, so, um, you know, self-belief is huge, man. Like, having the confidence uh, to go up against these players is, uh, is really important. Um, and if you don't back yourself, like, who's going to, right? Who's going to back yourself? Um, but you know, if it's if it's the if you're if you're an up and coming player, I think it's a really good mentality to adopt, uh, and then still being objective about it after the game. But you know, me going against um, you know I don't know finals or something like that. I just um, I just hope that I play well. You know, I don't really play the player that much. I just hope you know I'm remembering my rules that I've got written down. I'm just trying to focus on the game as much as possible not and not make mistakes as much mm -hmm. as possible. Just try, because oftentimes it's at the back of a tournament. You know, people think it's glamorous winning like super majors and stuff, but it's not, man. You're in the hall at 11 o'clock at night. There's like five people around. You know, everyone's packing up stuff everywhere. And oftentimes what will win you those games is if you are the person who's able to stay fresh, like you're able to stay zoned in for just another hour you know you just need to make it through the next hour or the next hour and a half um you know you might be playing against a very difficult person to play against you just need to say david i don't care you know it's going to be fine just make it through the next two hours and that's all you need to accomplish you can sleep on the train ride home you can sleep in the next couple of days that's fine just focus on getting through the next x amount of time and give it your absolute everything like don't 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 try and crumble mentally uh, and that's such a big thing. And if you find yourself being sloppy about things, then, you know, take some time out, put the clock on you. You know, you got, you got a long time to, you know, relatively speaking, quite a long time to play a game. Going outside and taking a breather for two minutes is probably going to do much more for your game than, you know, having 10 minutes on the clock left over after you've Stopping. lost. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Hopefully and I, love what, I, I love what you said about, you know, um, essentially paraphrasing, uh, being your own biggest team lead, uh, cheerleader. So, yeah. like, you know, if, if you are not cheering for yourself, who is? Really? Um, so, yeah, that's that's really great. Um, then we have a question from the chat from Nairi, uh, but you can read out yourself. When are you going to stop referring to yourself as not a Teams player? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, maybe next year at WTC, perhaps. No, but I've got a, I've got quite a few team <laughs> tournaments coming up uh, with Team Ignite. Like, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm super stoked to play it. Like... Um, you know, we played the uh, Team Ignite. We beat Team England at the last international um, team tournament. And, uh, yeah, you know, I was um, – I really do love it. I think it's the pinnacle of Warhammer in so many ways. I think it's the best expression of our game in so many ways. And it's really good to see the UKTC putting more team event in its calendars. You know, I think it's pretty clear that the public likes team events. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter how, how good your army is. You're going to have some game to things. And you know, just it's a great example of how differential scoring is clearly the best way to um, evaluate the game uh, as well, right? And keep players entertained for five turns instead of losing and then after turn one and then conceding. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, hopefully I'm a team player. But, uh, yeah, you know, people will probably just look at my singles record and then say, oh, he's a singles player, you know. But, uh, yeah. All right. And it's the nice. final... The final question, but probably the most important ones, uh, the, the most important one. This this is coming from Typhus. <laughs> Best and worst part of having your wedding in Santorini. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, yeah, the best part about having my wedding in Santorini is that if you've been to Santorini before, it is a jaw-droppingly gorgeous island. Uh, and my wedding was on the uh, cliff face of a uh, 
of a, of a, of a high uphill there and um, yes, just glassed everywhere and stuff. And uh, look, it was absolutely incredible. Sunset wedding. And stuff. I mean, we couldn't ask for more. What I would say is some advice is that if you are getting married, definitely take the opportunities to look abroad. You might find that they're a lot more affordable and doable than you otherwise would uh, would do. Because uh, people are, you know, and it, it's amazing. Uh, the only bad side about it is, um, yeah, it could, logistically it can be a bit difficult getting people across to Santorini. Yeah. But I think you'll find, you know, if you send the invitation out there, a lot of people will come for a holiday just as an excuse, just as uh, a few of my teammates did and whatnot like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, look, it's incredible. Um, the food was incredible as well. And I, I love Greece as well. Uh, it's an amazing country. I love how our show has turned from Warhammer 40k to actually yeah, yeah. real life advice and wedding advice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a wedding expert. <laughs> uh, but still, yeah, you know, you, you are you, you have the freshest experience, so we are going to rely on you on that. <laughs> uh, Joker, would you like to lead us out of the episode? Because I think the time has come to wrap this one up. I guess well, I'm never prepared for these. Uh, so on our road to LGT, which we have now fully engaged upon, and I'm obviously losing words again. Uh, I'm not my biggest cheerleader at this moment, uh, as you can probably tell. Uh, so this is the LGT's Lucky 7. Today we had David Gaylard of Team Ignite and Fireside Chat Podcast, if, if mm -hmm. that if I'm getting that name correct, I wanted to double check and I typed in Fireside into YouTube. It does actually throw up an Arctic Monkeys song. <laughs> Great band, but not necessarily the content you might be looking for if you're into Warhammer. Um, and David has been discussing top seven mistakes to avoid before and during any event. Uh, I think if anyone can talk about uh, event prep, David's probably one of the best people. And uh, we've also had myself, the Joker, and Tweak uh, from Contact Lost uh, hosting this interview. We will be there at the LGT as well. If you want to grab a Contact Lost dice, which is something new, yes. uh, you will actually have an opportunity to do so at the event if you find a little booth or whatever we'll actually have set up. If you like what we do, please like, subscribe, consider becoming a patron. Also visit David's and Vic's uh, Fireside YouTube page as well, uh, as it's definitely one of the top shows out there. David, we should have asked. Joker has done half of the job, but is there anything else that you would like to plug? No, no, no. Uh, I would just like to say that you guys are doing some fantastic job leading up to LGT as well. And I uh, can't wait Thank to you. see you again uh, in uh, end of September. Uh, that'll be awesome. I think there's also an invitational happening, something like that. So maybe check that out. Um, yeah. So no, it's been a blast. Thank you. And I've been uh, I've been learning a lot as I've been uh, rambling through my ideas. Actually, so it's been good. <laughs> good to hear. And hopefully everyone can take something away from those. So yeah. Well, without further ado, um, until next time. Bye everyone, and thank you. Bye bye. See ya. <laughs>